Okay, so we're going to talk now about conventional, <coughs> excuse me, and digital imaging. So the components that make up a diagnostic radiograph, we're just looking globally here. So you need to have the position, so the anatomy, and the exposure factors. And those are really old pictures. But when we're talking about image receptors, we're going to talk first about film. So we're going to talk about the cassette. Within the cassette, there's intensifying screens, and then there's the x-ray film. There's computed radiography, where we have a PSP plate, which is photostimulable phosphor, and it has a latent image that is formed on that PSP plate. There's digital radiography, which uses a charged electronic device, a scintillator or photoconductor, uh, and it also has a latent image. So, film. What we're looking at with film is you have a polyester base. Okay, that gives it the structure. You go up one layer, you have your adhesive coating, you have your silver bromide crystals, and then you have a protective coating on the top. Now, if you have double emulsion film, it's going to be on both sides of the polyester base. So here's your polyester base. On the other side, you're going to have the adhesive coating, the silver bromide emulsion, and you're going to have the protective coating. You have intensifying screens, and the reason why we use them is it decreases the patient dose. 95% of the image created from um, the photons is from light from the uh, intensifying screens that exposes the film. The film has to be processed through a chemical processor to take the, um, the uh, latent image into a manifested image. So the image on the film when you expose film is called latent image. Once we process the film, there's the manifested image, and that's the image that we can actually see. So the idea of the intensifying screens is that you have one photon coming in, and it produces 30 units of energy, which is 30 units of basically what we would call light. So this is one PSP crystal, and if one photon comes in, it's going to give off 30 units of light. So, with computed radiography, you have a latent image on this phosphor plate. So, the phosphor plate is photostimulable phosphorescence. The x-rays strike the plate, and electrons are trapped in this high-energy state, and they stay there. So, the latent image is in the grains of the phosphor. We take a laser light, and we scan this plate, and it releases that stored high energy. So the laser signal is amplified and digitized, and it gives us a manifested image. So we have a latent image on a PSP plate where there, um, the electrons are trapped in a high energy state, and they're released by a laser light. And the light is amplified and digitized, and then it gives us the manifested image. In digital radiography, Image receptors use different elements that interact with the remnant x-rays. Remember we talked about primary beam, remnant beam, primary beams from the tube to the patient, remnant beams from the patient to the IR, the image receptor. So the different uh, elements that they'll use is cesium iodide, uh, gadolinium, oxysulfide, selenium. The latent image recorded on the, uh, is recorded on an electronic device. So the digital electronics create the manifested image. So there's a direct method and an indirect method. And we'll talk more about that when we get to your um, digital imaging um, class. So um, with the growth in computers, uh, this is getting faster and faster and faster and um, more reasonable for the hospitals to obtain this equipment. So the advantage is of digital radiography. Elimination of film and chemistry. Um, we used to have to take temperatures of the chemistry. Uh, the chemistry couldn't uh, cross or it would be contaminated. Um, the dryer would be off and we have sticky films. Um, there's all kinds of problems that we had with the film and the chemistry. So the film, if it wasn't stored upright, it would have pressure marks. It would get scratches on it. It would get sticky um, from too much humidity, even if it was really dry air then it would be static and it would expose our film. Um, we had a lot of problems with film and the chemistry. Um, we have a quicker turnaround time for patients uh, using CR and DR because um, the images come up a lot faster for us. 
image manipulation and adjustment, that's huge. So um, if you're underexposed, you're going to have to repeat the image. If you're overexposed, we can manipulate that image to um, make it so it's adequate for interpretation. Uh, you have to be very careful of Alara when you're doing this, though. Uh, the technical factors are still very, very, very important, and it's important that you do not increase your dose just so that you're not having to repeat due to being underpenetrated. And that's called exposure creep. We, I, we need to make sure that you are still exposing the patient with the correct technique. Um, there's the elimination of fog and the elimination of image storage, which is awesome. So there's geometric factors. So when we're talking about detail or resolution, with uh, film, we measure in, well, in anything, we measure in line pairs per millimeter, so LP over MM. And with film, it's 10 line pairs per millimeter. Digital does not have the resolving ability of film, but contrast enhancement is greater, and it, it's enough to make it worth it. So <clears throat> you have photographic properties. You have the operator, console, control, uh, panel. You have time, which is your seconds, milliseconds. You have voltage, which is your KVP, your amperage, which is your MA. So um, these are all factors that are going to um, be shown on your image. So um, depending on the photographic properties, if you're dealing with film, uh, we had different speeds of film. So we had 100, 200, 400. We had different speeds of films. We had different um, cassettes where our intensifying screens were different speeds in addition. Um, you have now CR plates that are um, high resolution, low resolution. Most of the time you guys don't even know what they are, um, but if you ask the person who purchased it, they'd be able to tell you. Um, and then of course with your operator console, you have your you know, you can set your KVP and your amperage and your time. Most of the time you guys just use MAS, so you include the time with your milliamps. Okay, so here's another thing here. So if we're looking at um, the film, so we're just going to stick with film for the moment. And you can see on A and B. So here, this is the film and how much density is on the film. So you can see this one has a lot more we'll say photon exposure to the image receptor than the other side. So if you look at the thickness here compared to the thickness here, this one is twice as thick. Therefore, we should have about half the exposure on the IR. And then here, these um, allow photons to get through here. So it's absorbing some. There's a lot of them, whereas there's less here. And it looks like some of the photons were able to pass through. So we have a higher density uh, image here. So we have more photons that made it to the image receptor. If we're looking here, if we're taking a KVP, and the KVP is of low voltage, so it doesn't have a lot of energy, then when it hits the anatomical part, if it doesn't have enough energy, it's not going to be able to make it through that anatomical part. So if you're shooting a hand at 30 KVP, it's not going to have enough energy to get through. Even if you take your mass up to 600, you're going to have 600 photons in here. Well, I shouldn't say that. You're going to have a lot of photons in here because I haven't mathematically calculated that. You have a lot of photons in here, but they're never going to make it onto your IR because you didn't give them enough energy to get through the thickness of the body part. If you have medium uh, voltage, you can see they make it further, but they may not make it all the way out. You may have one or two stragglers, but you're not going to have enough to make it through the body. And then here with high voltage, um, you're going to have a lot that make it onto your image receptor. Um, they're going to make it through the thickness of the part. Okay, so this is kind of the main idea when we talk about um, film density on thickness here and density, and then we talk about KVP on how much KVP you need to be able to penetrate the part. So when we talk about the thickness here, we talked about the double thickness, so it should be about half, and same thing here, so we have a lot more of these absorbing your photons compared to here, there's less of them absorbing your photons. Okay, so subject thickness and density, so um, what we're looking at here is the density of 
the patient, okay, so of your subject matter. So we're going to look at atomic number. So we go least dense to most dense. So air and gas, um, x-rays pass right through it. Fat is next. Muscle, bone, and metal. So metal should absorb all depending on the metal. So we use lead as a protective, but we use aluminum to filter out low energy photons that are not making it um, that are not going to be able to penetrate through the body. They only give skin dose. So what we'll do is we'll put aluminum as a filter. So it filters out the low energy. So when we talk about subject thickness and density, this is a air contrast barium enema. And this is a decubitus. So we can see here air is the blackest because the most photons made it through onto the IR. So it's black. Now the white part is the barium. And barium has a very high atomic number and it absorbed all the photons. Therefore, the image receptor shows it as white because there's no photons that hit the image receptor. It absorbed them all. So air here is black because all the photons got through and exposed the image receptor, whereas here the barium has a high atomic number and it absorbed the photons, so it's showing white on the image receptor. All right, so subject density or thickness and density. So when we talk about um, quality, we're talking about KVP. So you're going to hear me start to talk about quality. So KVP is quality. MAS is quantity. So KVP determines the wavelength of the X-ray and the penetrability of that photon. So secondary effects, um, secondary effects the amount of X-ray. So inadvertently, um, the first year we try not to tell you that KVP um, has anything to do with the amount of X-rays, but it has a little bit. And we'll talk more about that when we go into your physics, actual physics class. We're going to talk about why it does, how it does. But for here, for this class, I want you to know KVP is quality. And yes, it does a little bit have to do with your quantity, which is your MAS, so the amount of X-rays. Um, the higher the KVP, the higher the energy of your beam. So, milliampage. So, x-rays um, exposure rate is directly proportional to the MA, the amount of x-rays produced per unit of time. The greater the MA, the greater amount of radiation produced. So, milliampage, actually MAS, is your quantity, is how many um, electrons you're sending over to the anodes from the cathode. So, that's your quantity. So seconds, it's a change in exposure time is directly proportional to the radiation exposure or output. So if, as you know, the MA times the time here, MA times seconds is your MAS. So if you have 20 MAS, you can do 200 MA times 0.1 seconds is going to give you 20. Now you got to move the decimal. So you move the decimal over one and you've got 20 MAS. Or you can take 100 MA multiply it by 0.2 seconds and you're going to get 20 MAS. Okay, so there's multiple ways to calculate and when you look at your MA stations and your time stations on your consoles, you'll be able to see how you can change and do a variety. Typically we try to get the fastest time. So that reduces um, repeats due to motion. So we always try to pick the fastest time that we can. Okay, distance. So distance from the radiation source, so the tube to the IR, okay, um, or the image receptor. So photons travel in straight lines, but with the angle of the anode, they travel in a divergent path. So they're going in an outward way. So you can see here it's coming off the anode, and you can see that they're going, they're spreading out, geometric spread, okay? They're, they're traveling in straight lines though, okay? So increasingly larger area as they travel further away from the tube. A larger area is covered as the uh, distance increases, the amount of radiation per square inch is reduced. So the radiation in this box right here 
is going to be less than the radiation in this box here because of the geometric spread of the photons. Is there less overall in this area, in the whole area, com here compared to here? No. There's the same amount, but there's a larger area that they're spread out over. And the way uh, we can calculate this and it's called the inverse square law. So you have your intensity of 1 over intensity of 2, and it's called inverse square law. So the inverse is the distance 2 squared over the distance 1 squared. So it's inversely proportional. So the intensity of the x-rays reaching the receptor varies inversely with the square of the distance. So twice the distance amount of radiation per square inch is, on, is 1 fourth, sorry, that's 1 of its original value. So half the distance is four times greater. So here's a math equation for you guys to calculate out. Okay, fog. What is fog? And that's just not your normal marine layer. So fog from any source is increasing the overall density on your image receptor. So typically when we talk about fog, we're talking about film, but fog is any unwanted density on the film or IR. So Fog does not add to the diagnostic quality of the image. It degrades your image. We want to do everything we can to keep fog at a minimum. So it distracts from the quality due to the overall grayness. Um, it obliterates small little structures and little fracture lines that are beneficial when you're uh, having the radiologist read your film. Fog increases the volume of tissue. Fog increases as the volume of tissue increases. When the field size is reduced to a small volume of tissue, fog is reduced. So we want you to do what? Yep, that's right, collimate. All right, so you can see here how you can't even see the C-spine. There's so much fog, unwanted density on this image. It is obliterating. You can't even see the air cells, mastoid air cells, the mastoid tip. And you can see how the mandible, look at the rami. You can't even see the rami. It's just completely... Uh, wiped out due to fog. You get fog from having too high of KVP. So you've got to be careful. you got to make sure that you don't have too high of a KVP. So in fog is, we can contribute it to scatter, what you might know as scatter. So here we use a cone. Um, we still have fog, um, hard to see lines, but using this cone has helped it where we can see here. So if this is the same patient, you can see using a cone, where we've collimated in really tight, we can actually see all the lines that we need to to see if there's a fracture within this patient's mandible. All right, so cones, collimation, being limiting devices. So they attach the x-ray tube to reduce um, exposure field size. So they decrease the amount of radiation and they decrease the amount of scatter radiation, which therefore reduces the fog. So scatter radiation increases as the volume of irradiated tissue increases. So fog and scatter we use pretty much interchangeably, okay? So contrast, what is contrast? It's defined as variations in density, so the difference in densities. So seeing one um, outline of a kidney versus the fat around the kidney is contrast. So um, independence of contrast is uh, contrast and density. So density is possible without contrast. So you can have overall exposure to your image receptor, but contrast is not, uh, is without, contrast without density is not possible. So if you don't have any exposure on your image receptor, there's no way that you can have contrast because there's no density. So you have to have density in order to have contrast, but um, you can't have contrast without density. You get that? Read it a few times. All right, so subject contrast. So when I talk about subject contrast, I'm talking about the inherent anatomical structure that um, what we're imaging in the patient, okay? So it depends on the absorption of x-rays. Um, the greatest contrast demonstrated is between air and bone. So um, it'll be black and white, right? Bone's going to absorb all the x-rays, so it's going to be white on your image. And air, it's going to pass right through because there's nothing to absorb it. It's going to be black on your image. This here is a breast. So um, hard to tell, right? So this is a breast, and this is a CC view. And you can see the subject contrast is all the same here. So um, we're going to talk about how we play with KVP
trying to get more subject contrast, but that is in your next physics class. So um, you will have changes in your subject contrast based on age, the health of the patient, the body habitus. If the patient's 600 pounds versus 30 pounds um, on an adult, you're going to have huge differences in your contrast on the patient. It's also going to depend on pathology. It'll also depend on the thickness of the part. So all of that is, um, is affected. It will affect your contrast. All right, so contrast media. What do we use? Barium sulfite, typically. It has a high atomic number, it is dense, and it's a metallic salt. We also use air, so um, it's uh, what we call a negative contrast. So there's short scale, so a minimum number of gradations um, gradations of gray between black and white on a radiograph. So there's short scale, long scale, okay? So lower kilovoltage decreases the scale of contrast. So we're going to show you different scales here. Now I don't like the way this is, it's backwards, but I'll show you what I mean. Short scale. So we're talking about contrast. Short scale contrast. A minimum number of gradations of gray between black and white on a radiograph. So lower Kilovolts decrease the scale of contrast. So here, this is short scale. So it's short. There's between black and white, there's only a few. Okay? So this would be your low KVP. Low KVP is going to give you black and white. Long scale, on the other hand, an increased number of gradations between gray, um, between black and white, on a radiograph, so higher kilovolts increase the scale of contrast. So the higher you go here, you're gonna have more, higher you go with your KVP, the more shades of gray you're going to have between black and white. So here's your white, here's your black. So these are backwards. I don't like how these are backwards, but they're backwards. So long scale, high KVP. The way you remember this, a chest X-ray, okay? So it's all air, right? In, it's all black, basically. What you want to do is try to find little small shades of gray in there. So you're going to use a high KVP. Remember, we use like 110 to 120 KVP. So we're using that high KVP so that we can get these little small shades of gray so that we can see any abnormalities within the lung. Now, with short scale, we're fine using low KVP like on a hand because we just have bone, right, that we're really looking at. So having a short scale contrast is fine. All right, grids. So grids have lead strips with interspace material. They absorb 90% of scatter radiation. So when you use a grid, you need to increase your technique since the lead strips absorb some of your radiant remnant beam, radiant beam, I like that. So here is where your photons are coming out of your tube. Here's your primary beam. Inside the patient, you can have some scatter. So you're gonna have some, some crazy photons coming out of the patient in all different directions. So here's your remnant beam, these little squiggly lines coming through. And then you have a grid right here. So this is your grid. The lines have to come through the strips straight. So if it has a crazy line coming this way, the lead strips are going to absorb it. So it's not going to hit your image receptor. Okay, so one, you have to increase your technique when you use a grid because it's going to absorb your remnant scatter. So you're scattering um, along with some of your remnant beam. And um, what else was number two? So one, it's going to absorb um, your scatter and... Two, I have no idea. All right, so they absorb um, as much as 90% of your scatter or secondary radiation. So scatter can also be um, secondary. So here, um, we're not gonna make you calculate out, but I do want you to know your grid ratio. So grid ratio is um, you have right here, you have your height over your distance between your lead strips. Your grid frequency, you should know this, is um, one over your thickness of your lead strips plus your distance between the lead strips. Just know the formulas. 
I'm not going to make you calculate it. So this gives a good graph though. Um, coming in straight is your primary, or this isn't primary. Um, this is a parallel unfocused grid. So all the lines, uh, grid lines are going straight. So your scatter, after it hits the body, it comes off at a different angle. So scatter radiation is anything that changes direction. So any photon that changes direction is considered a scattered photon. So you can see here you have the photon coming in at an angle. These lead strips are going to absorb that. So that's taking away some of your density. So here is your primary right here coming straight through. Now this is a focus grid. So what that means is these little lead strips are angled. They're not straight up and down. So this accommodates for your divergent beam. So these grids that are focused are going to have a distance on them. So this focus grid might be 40 inches, might be 72 inches. It's going to tell you, you have to use the proper distance of your tube head or else you're going to have cut off. These photons need to come in at the angle of the strips. So if you're using a focus grid, make sure you know the, di uh, the distance so that you're sure not to have grid cut off. So you can see how these lead strips are absorbing the scatter. All right, so there's different positioning problems when using a grid. Here, this is correct positioning. You have the proper distance. You are um, coming through perfectly. Upside down, it's going to have grid cutoff. So the grid on a focus grid, um, it has angles of your lead strips. If it's upside down, you're going to have grid cutoff. If the grid is crooked, it's going to absorb all your photons. If it's off center on a focus grid, it's also going to have major cutoff because they're angled to be straight on. And then here, if you're too short on a focus grid, then your distance is off and you're gonna have grid cutoff. So it's set for a certain distance and you've got to hit that distance or else you're gonna have major problems using a grid. So when you're upstairs doing a KUB on a patient and you're using a grid on the floor and the bed is soft, you're gonna have most likely here grid cutoff due to the grid um, being angled. All right, so um, if you take a look at this cup, these are uh, two different angles. Um, I'll, well, I'll show you the two different angles, what the exposures here look like. So here we're shooting straight down. We have oil and water directly on top of each other. We cannot see that there are different densities. Here, if we shoot from the side, you can see that we have oil and water. So we have two different densities. This is one of the reasons why we want you to do 290 degrees, okay? So distortion, we're going to just touch on this for a minute. So distortion is false representation of the true shape of an object. So um, there's magnification um, that can happen. You have beam um, alignment issues and the CR is um, perpendicular to the body part and the IR. So here, um, you, as we are further away from the IR, the size of the object is going to be larger. So you always want to put the image receptor as close to the object being imaged so that you reduce the magnification of that item that you're doing. And distortion, you can see here how we're just catching an edge and it's going to make it bigger. Um, and we'll cover distortion and magnification in great lengths in your next physics class. I just kind of want you to know that you want to get the anatomical part as close to the image receptor to reduce um, magnification and distortion of your body part. All right, so OID, which is your object to image distance. So object to image distance. So increasing the OID increases magnification, which increases size distortion. So um, the part should be as close to the IR as possible. So here you have increased OID, and you can see that the divergent beam is going to make this a lot bigger than it truly is. So if this is right up against your image receptor, you're going to see it's going to be truer to size. There's always going to be some magnification, but you want to reduce it as much as possible. So you can see here the difference between the two. All right, so source to image uh, receptor distance is your SID. To reduce magnification, 
um, you need to increase your SID. So typically um, we use 40 and 72 inches. So 40 inches is going to have more magnification than 72 inches. 72 inches is going to have the least amount of magnification. If you think of that inverse square law where the geometric spread of those photons, that's why. So as the distance increases, the effect is similar to a decrease in focal spot size um, to the level of detail increases. So as you take your distance out, so from 40 to 72, you're gonna have less magnification, less distortion, which is equivalent to going from a large focal spot to a small focal spot in detail. So if increased OID, you need to increase your SID to decrease the magnification. So if your OID, if your part is far away from your image receptor, you need to take your SID out so you don't have the divergent photons coming out as strong. They're coming in straighter, so there's less magnification. And we'll cover that if you're confused on that more later. All right, so detail. Um, you want to reduce any kind of motion as much as you can. Um, there's always going to be some motion um, that's involuntary, like on a KUB or the heart's beating or whatever. So your radiographic detail um, is dependent on having the object as still as possible. So um, distinctness with which image of structures are recorded is called your visibility of detail. So the ability of the IR to record uh, images of structure. So the things that reduce your detail is fog and patient motion. Okay, those two decrease your um, recorded detail. So here we have um, focal spot coming off and you have a moving object and you can see how you have misrepresentation of the object. And the outer skirts is called penumbra and we'll cover that at another date and time. So your focal spot size. So the source from which x-rays originate is where is your focal track on your anode. So you get geometric unsharpness is controlled by your focal spot size. So a small focal spot um, gives you better geometric sharpness. So geometric unsharpness is directly proportional to the size of the focal spot. Smaller the focal, smaller the focus, smaller the structure lines that you can see. Okay. So um, this gives you an idea of the small versus large. So you can see the large focal spots coming off bigger and giving us a bigger, um, we call this penumbra. And so down here, small focal spot gives off smaller. All right, um, this talks about penumbra here. So focal spot distance, as the distance decreases, um, there's a loss of detail. So it's just opposite of saying as the distance increases, we get better detail. So this is just the opposite. So loss of detail due to magnification of an image and blurred around the edges. So the closer we are to the source or the further away our OID is, the bigger the unsharpness. So this area right here is called penumbra. This area is geometric unsharpness. So we want to reduce the penumbra as much as possible. And we can do that by taking the OID to as small as possible. If we can't change our OID, take the tube further out so that we reduce the penumbra so that the uh, photons are coming in straighter on the object. They're not coming in as divergent. And to um, here, you can see the difference between the two and your focal spot size. All right, so you can decrease your OID, you can increase your SID to help with your penumbra, your geometric and sharpness around the periphery of an object, okay? So this is just another picture of um, penumbra. That's it, I know it's a big one. So, good job. Review it a few times, read your books. Um, they'll really help. Bouchong is pretty good in uh, talking about all of this and uh, Faber is really good in addition and I'll post some Faber PowerPoints in addition. Okay.